chapter one of abraham lincoln a history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume six by john hay and john george nicolay chapter one pope's virginia campaign in order to understand the unfortunate consequence of the long delay of mcclellan in moving his army from the james to the potomac a few words of retrospect are here necessary on june twenty sixth eighteen sixty two general john pope was appointed to the command of the army of virginia consisting of the corps of fremont banks and mcdowell fremont having refused to serve under his junior was relieved of his command and his place taken by general franz siegel mcdowell and banks who might with much more reason have objected to the arrangement accepted it with soldierly and patriotic promptness general pope though still a young man was a veteran soldier he was a graduate of the class of eighteen forty two at west point had served with distinction in the mexican war and had had a great success in the capture of island number no. ten in the mississippi river in the spring of eighteen sixty two he had made a very favorable impression not only upon the president but upon most members of the cabinet he remained in washington for several weeks after having been assigned to his new command awaiting the arrival of general halleck the new general-in-chief and only left there on the twenty ninth of july to put himself at the head of his troops in the latter part of june the president being deeply anxious in regard to the military situation and desiring to obtain the best advice in his power had made as privately as possible a visit to general scott in his retirement to ask his counsel the only record of this visit is a memorandum from scott approving the president's own plan of sending mcdowell's command to reinforce mcclellan before richmond a plan the execution of which was prevented by lee's attack it is probable that at this same interview the appointment of halleck as general-in-chief was again suggested by general scott secretary chase says in his diary that so far as he knew no member of the cabinet was consulted in regard to it the appointment when made was received with general approval halleck was not mcclellan which was sufficient for the more vehement opponents of that general and he was not a republican which pleased the other party in fact he shocked the secretary of the treasury by saying at the first cabinet meeting he attended i confess i do not think much of the negro if halleck never fulfilled the high expectations at first entertained of him he at least discharged the duties of his great office with intelligence and fidelity his integrity and his ability were alike undoubted his deficiencies were rather those of temperament in great crises he lacked determination and self-confidence and was always more ready to avoid than to assume embarrassing responsibility after general halleck's return from the james the question of mcclellan's removal from command of the army of the potomac was much discussed in administration circles the president himself was averse to it secretary chase was the most prominent member of the government in its favor he urged it strongly upon general halleck thinking it necessary to the revival of the credit of the country halleck agreed with him in condemning mcclellan's military operations but thought that under his orders mcclellan would do very well pope in conversation with chase said he had warned the president that he could not safely command the army of virginia if its success was to depend on the cooperation of mcclellan for he felt assured that his cooperation would fail at some time when it would be most important but the resolution was taken upon halleck's report to withdraw mcclellan with his army on the thirtieth as we have seen mcclellan was ordered to send away his sick on the third of august he was directed to move his army to aquia creek reiterated orders entreaties arguments and reproaches were all powerless to hasten his movements or to bring him to the potomac in less than three weeks his first troops reynolds's division joined the army of virginia on the twenty third of august 
in the meantime pope had begun his campaign with an error of taste more serious than any error of conduct he ever committed he had issued an address to the officers and soldiers of the army of virginia containing a few expressions which had made almost all the officers of the army of the potomac his enemies he said i have come to you from the west where we have always seen the backs of our enemies from an army whose business it has been to seek the adversary and to beat him when he was found whose policy has been attack and not defence i presume that i have been called here to pursue the same system and to lead you against the enemy it is my purpose to do so and that speedily i desire you to dismiss from your mind certain phrases which i am sorry to find so much in vogue amongst you i hear constantly of taking strong positions and holding them of lines of retreat and a basis of supplies let us discard such ideas the strongest position a soldier should desire to occupy is one from which he can most easily advance against the enemy let us study the probable lines of retreat of our opponents and leave our own to take care of themselves let us look before us and not behind success and glory are in the advance disaster and shame lurk in the rear this address which had no other purpose than to encourage and inspirit his men was received to pope's amazement with a storm of angry ridicule which lasted as long as he remained in command of the army of virginia and very seriously weakened his hold upon the confidence of his troops and the respect of the public as a matter of course it rendered impossible any sincere sympathy and support from general mcclellan and those nearest to him it may even be doubted whether there had been from the beginning any probability of a good understanding between them from the moment pope arrived from the west he was regarded with jealousy by the friends of mcclellan as a certain rival and possible successor in the last days of june when mcclellan made his first intimation of a change of base pope had suggested and the president had conveyed his suggestion to mcclellan that it would be better for the latter if forced to leave the line of the chickahominy to fall back on the pamunkey the source from which the suggestion came was sufficient to ensure its rejection if there had been no other reason pope had taken great pains to establish friendly relations with mcclellan writing him as soon as he assumed command a long and cordial letter giving him a full account of his situation and intentions and inviting his confidence and sympathy in return mcclellan answered a few days later in a briefer letter in which he clearly foreshadowed an intention to resist the withdrawal of his army from its present position handicapped by this lack of cordial sympathy with him in the army of the potomac pope left washington on the twenty ninth of july to begin his work the first object of which was to make a demonstration in the direction of gordonsville to assist in the withdrawal of mcclellan's army from the james in pursuance of this intention generals banks and siegel were ordered to move to culpeper court house banks promptly obeyed his orders arriving there shortly before midnight on the eighth of august siegel from some mistake as to the road did not get there until the evening of the next day by that time banks had gone forward to cedar mountain and at that point with a force of less than eight thousand men of all arms he attacked the army corps of stonewall jackson consisting of ewell's a p hill's and jackson's divisions with such vigor and impetuosity that he came near defeating them though finally repulsed he inflicted such a blow upon jackson as to give him an exaggerated idea of his numbers and hearing two days afterwards that banks had been reinforced jackson thought best to retire to the rapidan by this time general lee having become convinced that mcclellan was about to leave the peninsula concluded to concentrate a large force upon pope's advance to attack and if possible to destroy it on the thirteenth of august general longstreet was ordered to the rapidan with the divisions of longstreet and jackson and stuart's cavalry corps general lee disposed of an army of about fifty four thousand men pope finding himself so greatly outnumbered retreated behind the rappahannock where he established himself without loss on the twentieth of august thus far pope had made no mistake he had succeeded in checking the advance of jackson in withdrawing such a force of the enemy from richmond as to leave mcclellan's retreat unmolested 
and had established his army in good condition on the north bank of the rappahannock under orders from general halleck he held the line of this river for eight days repulsing several attempts of the enemy to cross in hope as the general-in-chief said that during this time sufficient forces from the army of the potomac would reach aquia creek to enable us to prevent any further advance of lee and eventually with the combined armies to drive him back upon richmond baffled in his repeated attempts to cross the rappahannock in front of pope's position general lee resolved upon a flank movement to the left and entrusted it to stonewall jackson the latter executed the task with amazing audacity and swiftness marching round the right and rear of the union army through the villages of amisville orleans and salem pouring his forces through thoroughfare gap in the bull run mountains and striking pope's line of communication and a valuable depot of supplies at manassas junction jackson retired from this place and took up his position in the morning of the twenty eighth of august just north of the warrenton turnpike near the old battlefield of bull run longstreet's corps was so far behind jackson that a rapid change of front and concentration of all the troops at pope's and halleck's disposal ought to have destroyed jackson isolated as he was from the rest of lee's army but his position was not ascertained as soon as it should have been owing to causes which have led to infinite controversy the union forces were not brought together with the directness and celerity required and therefore it came about that in the morning of august twenty nine pope's main army confronted jackson on the warrenton pike at groveton porter was some three miles on the left near the manassas gap railroad and longstreet was on the march from thoroughfare gap to effect his junction with jackson's right there was still an opportunity to win a great victory general fitz john porter when at warrenton junction on the evening of the twenty seventh of august had received an order from general pope to march at one a m to bristow station but in the exercise of his own discretion he did not march until dawn this delay however had as yet no specially disastrous results and would probably never have been brought into such prominence as it afterwards assumed had it not been for the light which it was supposed to cast upon subsequent events porter was however in his place on the morning of the twenty ninth with his splendid corps in fighting trim some distance from general pope's left and a little in rear of his line of battle he had been ordered to centreville the night before but his orders had been changed early in the morning to proceed to gainesville instead no time had been lost by this change as his new order found him on his march at manassas junction whence he pushed out his column on the gainesville road his advance reaching a little stream called dawkins branch where it halted about nine o'clock general pope issued to mcdowell and porter a joint order directing them to move their commands towards gainesville and to establish communication between themselves and the main body on the warrenton turnpike general mcdowell relates in his testimony before the general court-martial of fitz john porter that he met general porter near the little stream just mentioned about three miles from manassas junction and five miles from gainesville they had some conversation in regard to the joint order and mcdowell communicated to porter a dispatch he had just received from general john buford to the effect that a considerable body of confederate troops was approaching from the direction of gainesville concluding from this and other circumstances that there was immediate need of the presence of one of them on the left flank of the main body of the union army then engaged with the enemy at groveton mcdowell resolved to take his troops in that direction on leaving general porter he said to him you put your force in here and i will take mine up the sudley springs road on the left of the troops engaged at that point mcdowell reached pope about five p m and reported to him with king's division commanded by hatch as king was suffering from a severe illness the fitful and broken battle which had raged all day between pope's and jackson's armies was ebbing to its close neither side having gained any decided advantage mcdowell's men were put in for the last sharp hour of fighting on pope's left opposite the point where longstreet who had come on the field without the knowledge of the union commanders was now posted
they lost heavily but fought with the greatest gallantry they finally retired in good order leaving one gun in the hands of the enemy which had continued to fire says the confederate colonel law until my men were so near it as to have their faces burnt by its discharges at four thirty pope who had waited all day for porter's flanking attack upon the confederate right and rear sent porter a peremptory order directing him to push forward into action keeping his right in communication with pope's left there is much discussion whether this order was delivered at five or six o'clock captain douglas pope who bore it says it was delivered at the earlier hour general porter claims that it was an hour later but at all events porter who had found indications of a strong force in his front waited in position till it grew dark and then retired that night general pope in deep exasperation sent an order to porter couched in harsh and peremptory terms directing him to report in person with his command on the field for orders early next morning august thirty porter reported with all of his command but one brigade and on this day one of the most sanguinary conflicts of the war the second battle of bull run was fought it was a battle which general pope was under no necessity of fighting he might easily have retired behind bull run and waited until franklin's corps which had been moving from alexandria with inexplicable slowness had joined him and replenished his supplies but the false reports of a retreat by the enemy the admirable fighting qualities of his troops displayed on the twenty ninth before his eyes and the fact that on the thirtieth he had porter's magnificent corps under his immediate orders and more than all perhaps the temperament of the man who was always ready to fight when there was a fair chance for him determined him to stay where he was and to risk a new battle on that historic field he made a mistake in supposing that the principal force against him was north of the warrenton turnpike he placed therefore the bulk of his own army on that side and attacked with great energy early in the afternoon porter's corps fought with its old-time bravery but his troops having come within the range of the enfilading fire of longstreet's guns the attack failed on the left later longstreet advanced on the confederate right a furious struggle took place for the possession of bald hill west of the sudley springs road and later sykes's regulars successfully defending into the night the henry house hill from the assault of the confederates covered the retreat of the union army across the stone bridge to centreville on both sides it was one of the hardest fought battles of the war the day after the battle general lee made no attempt to pursue or molest pope's army but on the evening of the first of september he essayed his usual flanking experiment with jackson's corps upon the union right wing at chantilly pope had foreseen this and prepared for it and a very severe action took place beginning at sunset and terminating in the darkness in the midst of a furious thunderstorm jackson had gone too fast and too far he was readily repulsed but the union army met with a heavy loss in the death of generals philip kearney and isaac i stevens there were few men in the service more able industrious modest and faithful than stevens and kearney was an ideal soldier brave cool patient and loyal on the morning of the first pope who seemed far more dispirited and discouraged by the evident hostility towards him existing among the officers of the army of the potomac than by any of his losses in battle had telegraphed to general halleck his opinion that the army should be withdrawn to the entrenchments in front of washington and in that secure place reorganized and rearranged when there is no heart in their leaders he says and every disposition to hang back much cannot be expected from the men these orders were given the same day and the army was brought back without molestation general pope attributed the failure of this campaign to general porter's inaction and his disobedience of orders upon the twenty seventh and twenty ninth the general court-martial composed of officers of high rank and character by which the charges were considered found general porter guilty and sentenced him to be cashiered 
he assured of his own integrity persistently protested against the injustice of this sentence and sought in every possible way to have it reversed general grant refused while he remained president to reopen the case though in his later years he changed his mind and wrote a paper in favor of general porter an advisory board consisting of generals schofield terry and getty appointed by president hayes to re-examine the case acquitted general porter of all blame except for indiscreet and unkind criticism of his superior officer a bill was passed by congress restoring him to the army but it was vetoed by president arthur who however removed porter's continuing disabilities by an executive order the question became involved in political considerations and feelings and when a quarter of a century later the democratic party had gained control of the house of representatives and the presidency general porter was restored to his former place in the regular army and honorably retired the act for his relief was passed by a vote of one hundred and seventy one to one hundred and thirteen in the house of representatives and of thirty to seventeen in the senate all the democrats in each case voting solidly in his favor and a large majority of the republicans against him with all the testimony adduced it is probable that porter would not have been convicted had it not been for his own letters written during the progress of the campaign it was these letters which furnished the theory of the prosecution of porter that he felt the good of the army and of the country required that pope should be deposed from the command for which he believed him unfit and that mcclellan should have his old army back again amid all the confusion of councils and the inefficiency of those in high places it is cheering to observe the coolness and energy with which some of the subordinate officers did their work among these colonel herman haupt chief of railway construction and transportation deserves a word of notice much of the information the government received during these troubled days came from him in default of intelligent orders he himself set on foot reconnaissances and measures of relief on one occasion august twenty seven having proposed an expedition to convey forage and subsistence to pope's army he was directed to see mcclellan if possible and consult with him otherwise to go ahead as proposed he gives this account of the interview which took place between him and the general at alexandria after he had found him on a transport near that place haupt told him all the news he had gathered and asked for permission and a small escort to send a train with supplies to pope who was desperately in want of everything general mcclellan listened and when haupt ceased remarked that he could not approve of the plan that it would be attended with risk haupt thought the risk would not be excessive but his arguments availed nothing the general refused his consent to the plan proposed and made no suggestion of any other he was faint and ill and asked haupt for some refreshment which revived him and he then sent a dispatch to washington transmitting the information haupt had given him but making no suggestion for pope's assistance he then rode away leaving haupt in the deepest perplexity he knew what ought to be done but lacked authority had i been so fortunate he says as not to have found general mcclellan i could have acted but my hands were tied the army was suffering and in danger i could not remain quiet i determined to assume the responsibility but as i considered it proper to notify general mcclellan i sent him at nine fifty p m a notice that at four a m i proposed to start a wrecking and construction train bound for bull run also a train with forage and subsistence i asked for two hundred sharpshooters only as a train guard to report at four a m and stated that if the troops did not report we would go without them no answer was received to this dispatch and near midnight i took a lantern and visited the camps four miles down the road to see if i could not get a guard i found general hancock in bed in his tent he rose immediately and cheerfully agreed to give me the force i required 
general pope regarded the reluctance of mcclellan in forwarding reinforcements to him from alexandria as another important factor in his failure he says in his report that reynolds's division about two thousand five hundred strong which joined him on the twenty third of august at rappahannock station and the corps of heitzelman and porter about eighteen thousand between them which arrived on the twenty sixth and twenty seventh at warrenton junction about twenty thousand five hundred altogether were all of the ninety one thousand veteran troops from harrison's landing which ever drew trigger under my command franklin and sumner with twenty thousand effectives reported to him at centreville too late to redeem the campaign it is a fact not without significance that the last troops which joined him before the hard fighting began did so before mcclellan took charge at alexandria general sumner that brave old warrior who considered it a personal injury to be kept from any battlefield within his reach broke out in hot anger when he learned that mcclellan had said his corps was not in a condition for fighting if i had been ordered to advance right on he said afterwards from alexandria by the little river turnpike i should have been in that second bull run battle with my whole force he was made to waste forty-eight hours in camp and in a fruitless march to the aqueduct bridge in the matter of franklin's corps the correspondence of general mcclellan himself furnishes the most undeniable evidence that he did not think best to hurry matters in reinforcing pope halleck on the twenty seventh had telegraphed him the probability of a general battle franklin's corps he said should move out by forced marches carrying three or four days provisions this order was repeated later in the day in more urgent terms that franklin's corps should move in that direction manassas as soon as possible mcclellan answered not that franklin had started but that he had sent orders to him to prepare to march he afterwards discovered that franklin was in washington and gave orders to place the corps in readiness to move in the afternoon he sent dispatches indicating his belief that it might be better for franklin not to go and questioning whether washington were safe and in the evening of the same day this conviction had gained such strength in his mind that he squarely recommended that the troops in hand be held for the defence of the capital on the morning of the twenty eighth halleck telegraphed direct an order to franklin to move towards manassas but at one o'clock in the afternoon general mcclellan replied the moment franklin can be started with a reasonable amount of artillery he shall go at four ten o'clock he added general franklin is with me here i will know in a few minutes the condition of artillery and cavalry we are not yet in condition to move may be by to-morrow morning halleck in despair at this inertia had telegraphed at three thirty o'clock not a moment must be lost in pushing as large a force as possible towards manassas so as to communicate with pope before the enemy is reinforced to this after the lapse of an hour mcclellan answered your dispatch received neither franklin nor sumner's corps is now in condition to move and fight a battle it would be a sacrifice to send them out now at night general halleck with vehement earnestness ordered there must be no further delay in moving franklin's corps towards manassas they must go to-morrow morning ready or not ready if we delay too long to get ready there will be no necessity to go at all for pope will either be defeated or be victorious without our aid if there is a want of wagons the men must carry provisions with them until the wagons can come to their relief at last mcclellan answered that he had ordered franklin to march at six in the morning of the twenty ninth he then enumerated the force he had in hand amounting to about thirty thousand men and added with a naivete which in view of halleck's urgent telegrams for two days would be comical if the consequences had not been so serious if you wish any of them to move towards manassas please inform me on the twenty ninth of august he got franklin started but still protested against the order to move him and continually through the day sent dispatches suggesting that franklin should go no farther until at last halleck even his excessive patience giving way replied at three o'clock i want franklin's corps to go far enough to find out something about the enemy i am tired of guesses 
at a quarter before three in the afternoon of the twenty ninth general mcclellan sent the following extraordinary dispatch to mr lincoln which to do him justice must be given in entire the last news i received from the direction of manassas was from stragglers to the effect that the enemy were evacuating centreville and retiring towards thoroughfare gap this by no means reliable i am clear that one of two courses should be adopted first to concentrate all our available forces to open communications with pope second to leave pope to get out of his scrape and at once use all our means to make the capital perfectly safe no middle ground will now answer tell me what you wish me to do and i will do all in my power to accomplish it i wish to know what my orders and authority are i ask for nothing but will obey whatever orders you give i only ask a prompt decision that i may at once give the necessary orders it will not do to delay longer there can be no mistaking the transparent menace of this dispatch of the alternatives he suggested he meant but one by his protests of the last three days as well as by his actions he had clearly shown his disinclination to attempt to open communication with pope there is but one course therefore left which commends itself to his judgment that is to leave the army of virginia to its fate this dispatch was sent directly to the president in answer to a request from him for news and the president replied with more of magnanimity than of dignity i think your first alternative to wit to concentrate all our available forces to open communication with pope is the right one but i wish not to control that i now leave to general halleck aided by your counsels during the two entire days the twenty ninth and thirtieth while pope was engaged in his desperate struggle at bull run with the whole of lee's army the singular interchange of telegrams between halleck and mcclellan continued the one giving orders growing more and more peremptory every hour and the other giving excuses more or less unsatisfactory for not obeying them but late at night of the thirty first of august when the fighting was virtually over general halleck upon whom the fatigue and excitement of the past week had had a most depressing effect suddenly betrayed that weakness of character which so often surprised his friends and sent to mcclellan a dispatch breathing discouragement in every word in which saying that he was utterly tired out he begged mcclellan to assist him in this crisis with his ability and experience to this general mcclellan replied with unusual promptness a few minutes after receiving it asking for an interview to settle his position in a letter an hour later he gave his decided opinion that pope had been totally defeated and that everything available should be drawn in at once he thinks such orders should be sent immediately he has no confidence in pope's dispositions to speak frankly he says and the occasion requires it there appears to be a total absence of brains and i fear the total destruction of the army he falls back again into his sententious strain the occasion is grave and demands grave measures the question is the salvation of the country it is my deliberate opinion that the interests of the nation demand that pope shall fall back to-night if possible and not one moment is to be lost the same advice was repeated by pope the next morning and halleck at once gave the necessary orders on september one general mcclellan visited washington and conversed with halleck and the president mr lincoln had been greatly distressed and shocked by the account pope had given of the demoralization of the army of the potomac which in his opinion proceeded from the spirit of hostility and insubordination displayed openly by some of its most prominent officers he requested mcclellan to use his great personal influence with his immediate friends in that army to correct this evil mcclellan while not crediting the report of pope nevertheless complied with the request of the president and sent a letter to porter urging him and all his friends for his sake to extend to general pope the same support they had always given him to which porter replied in loyal and soldierly terms on the next day september two mr lincoln placed the defences of washington and the command of the troops as they arrived from the front in the hands of general mcclellan there is no other official act of his life for which he has been more severely criticized but we need not go far to find a motive for it the restoration of mcclellan to command was mr lincoln's own act 
the majority of the cabinet were strongly opposed to it the secretary of war and the secretary of the treasury agreed upon the twenty ninth of august in a remonstrance against mcclellan's continuance in command of any army of the union they reduced it to writing it was signed by themselves and the attorney-general and afterwards by the secretary of the interior the secretary of the navy concurred in the judgment of his colleagues but declined to sign it on the ground that it might seem unfriendly to the president in the cabinet meeting of the second of september the whole subject was freely discussed the secretary of war disclaimed any responsibility for the action taken saying that the order to mcclellan was given him directly by the president and that general halleck considered himself relieved from responsibility by it although he acquiesced and approved the order he thought that mcclellan was now in a position where he could shirk all responsibility shielding himself under halleck while halleck would shield himself under the president mr lincoln took a different view of the transaction saying that he considered general halleck as much in command of the army as ever and that general mcclellan had been charged with special functions to command the troops for the defence of washington and that he placed him there because he could see no one who could do so well the work required the secretary of the treasury in recording this proceeding does not disguise his scorn for the lack of spirit displayed by the president and on a later date he adds it is indeed humiliating but prompted i believe by a sincere desire to serve the country and a fear that should he supersede mcclellan by any other commander no advantage would be gained in leadership but much harm in the disaffection of officers and troops mr lincoln certainly had the defects of his great qualities his unbounded magnanimity made him sometimes incapable even of just resentments general mcclellan's worst offences had been committed against the president in person the insulting dispatch from savage's station and the letter from harrison's landing in which he took the president to task for the whole course of his civil and military administration would probably have been pardoned by no other ruler that ever lived yet mr lincoln never appeared to bear the slightest ill-will to the general on account of these affronts he did feel deeply the conduct of mcclellan towards pope he was outraged at mcclellan's suggestion to leave pope to his fate he said to one of his household on the thirtieth of august he has acted badly towards pope he really wanted him to fail and after he had placed him again in command of the army of the potomac he repeated this severe judgment but he added there is no one in the army who can man these fortifications and lick these troops of ours into shape half as well as he can again he said we must use the tools we have if he cannot fight himself he excels in making others ready to fight in the interests of the country he condoned the offences against pope as readily as those against himself it may perhaps even be said that mcclellan so far from suffering at the president's hands for his unbecoming conduct towards him gained a positive advantage by it it was not alone for his undoubted talents as an organizer and drill-master that he was restored to his command it was a time of gloom and doubt in the political as well as in the military situation the factious spirit was stronger among the politicians and the press of the democratic party than at any other time during the war not only in the states of the border but in many northern states there were signs of sullen discontent among a large body of the people that could not escape the notice of a statesman so vigilant as lincoln it was of the greatest importance not only in the interest of recruiting but also in the interest of that wider support which a popular government requires from the general body of its citizens that causes of offence against any large portion of the community should be sedulously avoided by those in power general mcclellan had made himself by his demonstration against the president's policy the leader of the democratic party mr lincoln for these reasons was especially anxious to take no action against mcclellan which might seem to be dictated by personal jealousy or pique and besides as general pope had himself reported there was a personal devotion to mcclellan among those in high command in the army of the potomac which rendered it almost impossible for any other general to get its best work out of it 
general ethan allen hitchcock one of the most accomplished officers of the old army gave this as the reason for his declining that command it is difficult to regard without indignation the treatment however necessary and justifiable which the principal actors in this great transaction received mcclellan whose conduct from beginning to end can only be condemned received the command of a great army reorganized and reinforced and with it a chance for magnificent achievement if he had been able to improve it which no officer before or since ever enjoyed on this continent pope who had fought with the greatest bravery and perseverance a losing battle against lee's entire army all the way from the rapidan to the potomac encouraged at every point with the hope of reinforcements which only reached him too late and finally by his misfortune adding a new lustre to the prestige of his rival and enemy received simply the compliments and congratulations of his superiors and was then removed to a distant department of the frontier to take no further part in the stirring scenes of a war in which he was so well qualified to bear an honourable part mcdowell a perfect soldier among the bravest ablest and most loyal officers of the army who had done his whole duty and much more who zealously went before and beyond the orders of his superiors always seeking the post of utmost danger and toil was found at the close of this campaign in which his conduct deserved the highest credit with his reputation so smirched and tarnished by calumny that he was never after during the war considered available for those high and important employments for which he was better equipped than almost any of his comrades a court of inquiry it is true vindicated him completely from every charge that malice or ignorance had invented against him but the two disasters of bull run in successive summers for neither of which he was to blame remained in the popular mind inseparably connected with his name general mcclellan himself never appreciated the magnanimity with which he had been treated in fact he thought the magnanimity was all upon his side as time wore on he continually exaggerated in his own mind the services he had rendered and the needs of the government at the time he had been placed in command until he created for himself the fantastic delusion that he had saved the administration from despair in the last lines he ever wrote shortly before his death he gave this absolutely new and most remarkable account of the visit which lincoln and halleck made to him on the second of september he the president then said that he regarded washington as lost and asked me if i would under the circumstances as a favour to him resume command and do the best that could be done without one moment's hesitation and without making any conditions whatever i at once said that i would accept the command and would stake my life that i would save the city both the president and halleck again asserted that it was impossible to save the city and i repeated my firm conviction that i could and would save it they then left the president verbally placing me in entire command of the city and of the troops falling back upon it from the front it is possible that in the lapse of twenty years general mcclellan's memory had become so distorted by constant dwelling upon imagined wrongs that he was at last capable of believing this fiction it was a fancy adopted in the last years of his life a year after his removal from command he wrote a voluminous report of his entire military history filling an octavo volume he was then the acknowledged favorite of the democratic party the predestined candidate for the presidency in opposition to lincoln he embodied in that report every incident or argument he could think of to justify his own conduct and to condemn that of the government yet in this long narrative there is no hint that lincoln or halleck thought the capital was lost he apparently never dreamed of such a thing while lincoln lived he gave no intimation of such a charge while halleck survived although their relations were frankly hostile only after both these witnesses had passed away and a direct contradiction was thus rendered impossible did it occur to him to report this conversation between his patriotic heroism and their craven despair there is another proof that this story was an afterthought in a letter to his family written on the second the very morning of this pretended conversation he merely says i was surprised this morning when at breakfast by a visit from the president and halleck in which the former expressed the opinion that the troubles now impending could be overcome better by me than any one else pope is ordered to fall back upon washington and as he re-enters everything is to come under my command again when we consider that in these private letters he never omits an opportunity for heroic posturing 
it is impossible to believe that if lincoln and halleck an hour or two before had been imploring him to save the capital he would not have mentioned it the truth is mcclellan himself has left evidence of the fact that it was he who thought washington in danger on the thirty first of august he wrote to his wife i do not regard washington as safe against the rebels if i can quietly slip over there i will send your silver off if it were worth while to cumber these pages with the refutation of a calumny so transparently false we could bring the testimony of a score of witnesses to show that mr lincoln during the first days of september was unusually cool and determined grieved and disappointed as he was at the failure of pope's campaign his principal preoccupation was not at any time the safety of washington it was that lee's army as he frequently expressed it should not get away without being hurt on monday morning he said they must be whipped here and now pope must fight them and if they are too strong for him he can gradually get back to these fortifications at the time mcclellan represents him as hopeless of saving washington he had no thought of the safety of that place in his mind except as a secondary and permanent consideration he was making ready a force to attack the enemy on the third of september he wrote with his own hand this order which sufficiently shows the mood he was in ordered that the general-in-chief major-general halleck immediately commence and proceed with all possible dispatch to organize an army for active operations from all the material within and coming within his control independent of the forces he may deem necessary for the defense of washington when such active army shall take the field this order countersigned by the secretary of war was delivered to halleck by general townsend and the work of preparing the army for the offensive was at once begun mcclellan under halleck's direction went heartily to work to execute the orders of the president he had none of the protecting airs he gives himself in his memoirs his conduct was exemplary mcclellan said lincoln on the fifth is working like a beaver he seems to be aroused to doing something by the sort of snubbing he got last week the work he was now engaged upon was congenial staff work and he performed it with great zeal and efficiency it suited him in after years to pretend that he was acting without orders and without communication with the government it was his favorite phrase that he went to antietam with a halter about his neck but his letters written at the time contradict such assertions he wrote from washington on the seventh of september i leave here this afternoon to take command of the troops in the field the feeling of the government towards me i am sure is kind and trusting end of chapter one chapter two of abraham lincoln a history volume six this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 2. Mexico. While the administration of Mr. Lincoln was exerting all its energies to cope with the exacting emergencies of civil war, it was compelled to watch with unsleeping vigilance the measures and intentions of enemies all over the world the hostility of european powers unable to find a pretext for a direct attack manifested itself in a movement on what may be called the right flank of the republic against its sister nation mexico this unhappy country so long torn by internal dissensions which were the direct result of the cruel and corrupt rule of spain had reached and perhaps passed its lowest point of anarchy and misrule the presidency was now occupied by the most remarkable man that mexico had produced and under the firm and patient hands of benito juarez the beginnings of something like social order were already making their appearance in the public life of the country but the state of things existing there was still deplorable all the evil growths that spring up in the track of a long and devastating civil war flourished with rank luxuriance there was little safety for life or property assassinations were of frequent occurrence there was only the most imperfect security for the enforcement of contracts these evils which the mexicans themselves were forced to bear uncomplainingly roused constant and vehement reclamations on the part of foreigners doing business in mexico yet still they remained there it was difficult for many who had embarked all their interests in affairs to get away and it is to be presumed that there as elsewhere 
fishing in troubled waters afforded a prospect of such large gains as to compensate for the enormous risks involved but on the seventeenth of july eighteen sixty one on the recommendation of president juarez the congress which had already suppressed the religious orders and confiscated the church property as a further means of financial relief to the nation suspended for two years all payments on the national debt which was principally in the hands of foreigners shortly after this there was a slight street disturbance in which a political procession finding itself in front of the french legation as if with a premonition of the hostile relations which were soon to exist between the two countries broke out in shouts of death to the french and a shot was fired at the legation this outrage led to a severe protest on the part of the diplomatic body not confined to the european ministers but headed by thomas corwin the american plenipotentiary whose sincere friendship for mexico was well known the government struggling with every kind of embarrassment was unable to give prompt redress either in the matter of financial default or in the more flagrant cases of outrage and murder a tax of one per cent on all capital exceeding two thousand dollars was imposed in the month of august and this led to new protests on the part of the diplomatic body sir charles lennox wyke the representative of great britain in mexico addressed frequent communications to the mexican foreign office in terms of frank disrespect to which mr zamacona the mexican minister of foreign affairs replied in a tone of exquisite courtesy trying to excuse what could not be remedied and continually making promises which it was impossible to keep until at last sir charles wick made upon the mexican government the impossible demand that they should by executive action within forty-eight hours annul the decree of congress of the seventeenth of july failing which he ceased his official diplomatic relations with them meanwhile diplomacy had been busy on the other side of the atlantic between the courts of london paris and madrid the british government appears in the matter to have had no object in view but the collection of money due to british subjects and the redress of wrongs committed upon them in mexico the intervention of spain though it was mainly prompted by similar motives was not without a suspicion of ulterior dynastic designs while on the part of france there was a mixture of many different schemes some of which were avowed and others were unavowable it is not within the scope of this work to recount the scandals with which the air of paris was filled in reference to speculations in which persons near the tuileries were said to have been engaged and which were understood to have exercised a powerful influence upon the conduct of the french government in its mexican enterprise it is enough for us to quote the letter which the emperor himself wrote to general fourier in the summer of eighteen sixty two to show that the expedition to mexico was founded upon the hope that the internal troubles of the american republic would prevent its rulers from interposing a veto upon the emperor's scheme of conquest and that he intended nothing less than to establish an empire in mexico which would build up a barrier to the supposed ambitious schemes of the united states and vastly increase the power and prestige of the french republic in both hemispheres it is our interest he writes that the republic of the united states shall be powerful and prosperous but it is not at all to our interest that she should grasp the whole gulf of mexico rule thence the antilles as well as south america and be the sole dispenser of the products of the new world we see to-day by sad experience how precarious is the faith of an industry which is forced to seek its raw material in a single market under all the vicissitudes to which that market is subject if on the contrary mexico preserves her independence and maintains the integrity of her territory if a stable government be there established with the aid of france we shall have restored to the latin race on the other side of the ocean its force and its prestige we shall have guaranteed the safety of our own and the spanish colonies in the antilles we shall have established our benign influence in the centre of america and this influence while creating immense outlets for our commerce will produce the raw material which is indispensable to our industry mexico thus regenerated will always be favourable to us not only from gratitude but also because her interests will be identical with our own and because she will find support in the good will of european powers if this scheme of the emperor's as outlined in his own words seems vague and visionary 
it is on that account all the more characteristic of its author few of his schemes could bear the test of reality his most ambitious plans were of the stuff that dreams are made of and his purposes in regard to mexico were none the less hostile to the true interests of the american republic that they were founded upon an absolute misconception of facts and faded away in logical and predestined disappointment and discredit in the correspondence of earl russell with lord cowley the british minister in paris it is evident that he was aware of some of the difficulties in the way of a tripartite joint intervention he referred to the dislike and apprehension which the advent of spanish troops would excite in mexico on the part of the liberals and of the odium of british interference on the part of the church faction but he exhibited a singular ignorance of the state of feeling in the south when he spoke of the universal alarm which would be excited both in the united states and the southern states at the contemplation of european interference in the domestic quarrels of an american independent republic the southern leaders would have hailed with joy the annexation of half a dozen spanish american republics by any european power which would have assisted them in their furious family quarrel yet lord russell seriously thought the menace of the independence of mexico on the part of european powers would have a tendency to bring about a reconciliation between the northern and southern states a few days later lord russell announced that the government of the queen were now prepared to enter into a convention with france and spain to obtain redress for injuries from mexico but that it would be proper to stipulate in the convention that the forces of the contracting parties should not be employed for any other purpose than that specified and especially that they should not interfere with the internal government of mexico he thought that the government of the united states ought to be invited to adhere to any such convention but he did not think it necessary that in anticipation of the concurrence of the united states the three powers should defer the commencement of their contemplated operations against mexico the same dispatch was sent to sir john crampton at madrid the government of spain made no special objection to inviting the adherents of the united states though marshal o'donnell doubted whether that country would care to take part in the matter and added that spain could not think in any case of postponing the measures which it had determined to adopt he disclaimed any desire for exclusive advantages on the part of his government in his opinion nothing could be more detrimental to spain than the recovery of her ancient possessions in america with regard to cuba and the philippines it was different because their insular position and other circumstances still rendered their possession advantageous to the mother country the recent acquisition by spain of santo domingo might he remarked appear to be a deviation from this principle but that was accounted for by its proximity to cuba as sir john crampton reported in a subsequent dispatch there was perhaps a shade of difference between the views of the british and the spanish governments in this matter while england wanted absolutely nothing but money due her and a redress of injuries spain while agreeing in general to the policy of non-intervention in the internal affairs of mexico still hoped as the result of the measures proposed for the establishment of some settled form of government which would afford guarantees for the future calderon colantes remarked that at the bottom of the civil strife in mexico there was a contest between two races which was not generally borne in mind the spanish race was at all times in the minority in that country and from natural causes the disproportion between it and the original indian race was continually increasing if these causes continue to operate unchecked by the moral superiority of the european element and were aggravated by a continual recurrence of the intestine struggles there could be no doubt that the germs of civilization which had been originally planted by spain would be crushed out and the country would relapse into something of the same condition in which it was found by cortes these ideas however seemed merely didactic for when sir john asked whether the spanish government contemplated a prolonged occupation of the mexican ports until such a government as they desired could be established calderon colantes emphatically repudiated any such design the president and mr seward saw clearly the inconvenience and the possible serious complications which would result from the proposed intervention and before it was concluded they made all possible efforts to remove the supposed necessity for it mr corwin under his instructions supported energetically at mexico the just reclamations and the reasonable suggestions of the british legation 
and when he was convinced that the mexican government were really unable to meet the equitable demands of the foreign representatives he undertook to negotiate an arrangement for supplying them with the means which they lacked this negotiation first took the form of a proposed guarantee by the united states of the payment of the interest of the foreign national debt of mexico and while these negotiations were in progress mr seward informed the representatives of england france and spain of the intentions of the american government and suggested that the proposed intervention should therefore be postponed he received no encouragement from lord lyons to whom this project was communicated that the three powers would look favorably upon it and the plan of the american government was afterwards modified to that of advancing to mexico a large sum of money all at once for the extinction of her foreign obligations but the entire scheme came to nothing the tripartite convention was signed in london on the thirty first of october it was very brief and simple it merely provided for the sending of an expeditionary force to mexico to seize and occupy certain ports on the coast of that country each of the contracting parties was to send a commissioner with full authority to arrange for the application and distribution of the money due from mexico as it should be collected each disclaimed any intentions looking toward the acquisition of territory or of any particular advantage or any coercion of the mexican nation in their form of government the convention also provided that the united states should be invited to adhere to it the amount of the expeditionary force to be contributed by each nation was not specified in the convention but it was afterwards arranged that the spanish squadron should consist of twelve or fourteen vessels carrying in all about three hundred guns two large steam transports were to accompany the squadron and the number of troops was to amount to four thousand or five thousand men the whole expedition was to be under the command of lieutenant-general don juan prim who was also appointed the diplomatic commissioner of spain the french expedition was to be about the same size under the command of admiral Jurine de la Guaver. before the time came for the expedition to start the incident of the capture of mason and slidell had so strained the relations between great britain and the united states that it was not thought prudent in london to detach any large force to the coast of mexico on the fourth of december lord russell informed the french and spanish courts that her majesty's government in the present state of their relations with the united states proposed to send only one line of battle ship and two frigates to form part of the expedition to mexico and that the number of their supernumerary marines would be seven hundred the invitation of the three powers to the united states to adhere to the convention of london was delivered on the thirtieth of november mr seward replied that the president did not question the undoubted right of the three powers to seek severally or jointly redress of their grievances from mexico and to levy war against that power if necessary he expressed the satisfaction the president felt in the assurance given by the powers that they would not seek to impair the right of the mexican people to choose and freely constitute the form of their own government it was true that the united states had claims against mexico but the president was of the opinion that it would be inexpedient to seek satisfaction of those claims at this time through an act of accession to the convention among the reasons mr seward continues for this decision which the undersigned is authorized to assign are first that the united states as far as it is practicable prefer to adhere to a traditional policy recommended to them by the father of their country and confirmed by a happy experience which forbids their making alliances with foreign nations secondly mexico being a neighbor of the united states on this continent and possessing a system of government similar to our own in many of its important features the united states habitually cherish a decided good will towards that republic and a lively interest in its security prosperity and welfare animated by these sentiments the united states do not feel inclined to resort to forcible remedies for their claims at the present moment when the government of mexico is deeply disturbed by faction within and exposed to war with foreign nations and of course the same sentiments render them still more disinclined to allied war against mexico than to war to be urged against her by themselves alone mr seward then referred to the proposed treaty of the united states with mexico the object of which was to place it within the power of that nation to satisfy the just claims and demands of foreign powers and promised if these negotiations offered any sufficient ground on which to justify a proposition to the high contracting powers on the part of mexico he would hasten to submit such a proposition to them he then informed the high contracting parties that the president proposed to send a naval force to the gulf of mexico to guard the interests of the united states and its citizens 
this and all other measures being taken in the spirit of peace and friendship not only towards mexico but towards the allied powers themselves spain did not wait for her colleagues for on the fifth of december the spanish expedition sailed from havana to vera cruz it was an imposing squadron of twenty-six men of war and transports the troops embarking amounting to six thousand of all arms under the command of don manuel gasset this was a much larger force than was originally intended and the chagrin of the english government both at the premature departure of the spanish expedition and at its greatly increased proportions was deepened by the announcement received in january from the french government that the emperor proposed to increase his expeditionary force by three thousand or four thousand men the seven hundred british marines thus came to form a most insignificant proportion of the entire force it was not many days later when lord russell became aware of the ulterior intentions of the powers in regard to the future government of mexico he was informed by lord cowley on the twenty fifth of january that it was the general impression in paris among the officers going with the reinforcements to mexico that the object of the expedition was to place the archduke maximilian of austria upon the throne the french minister of foreign affairs being interpolated on the subject said there had been no communication between the governments of france and austria in regard to it but that application had been made by prominent mexicans to the archduke himself earl russell dryly communicated this information to sir charles wick a few days later saying if the mexican people by a spontaneous movement place the austrian archduke on the throne of mexico there is nothing in the convention to prevent it on the other hand we could be no parties to a forcible intervention to that purpose the mexicans must consult their own interests the allied forces met with no opposition in their occupation of veracruz and the fortress of san juan de ulia the mexicans retired a little distance into the interior and limited their work of resistance to cutting off the supplies of the enemy they had in their weakness and poverty a more powerful auxiliary upon their side than a disciplined army corps would have been the climate of the mexican lowlands the tierras calientes is one of the most deadly in the world to those unaccustomed to it by holding the high ground between these lowlands and the capital they simply condemned the invading force to death by yellow fever the actual presence of the invading army upon their shores had for a time stilled the strife of faction in mexico and the conciliatory policy of president juarez toward his opponents succeeded for the time in banding together all the constitutional parties in defense of the administration united in this momentary concord they were capable of offering a formidable resistance to the expeditionary corps consisting of only about twenty five thousand in all if they should attempt to march into the more healthful interior simultaneously with this novel concord among the mexicans appeared the beginnings of serious contention among the foreigners while the purpose of france seemed to be to forward certain stock jobbing schemes which had their promoters in neighborhoods near the throne and to establish a latin empire on the ruins of the republic under the rule of an austrian archduke it soon became apparent that the spanish civil and military authorities concentrated on the astute and resolute juan prim marquis de lo casillos had very different intentions he carried in petto it was thought the scheme of placing upon the throne of the aztecs a prince of the house of bourbon and after having initiated and taken the advance of the expedition he did not regard with complacency the prospect of acting merely as the cat's paw of france in its further progress and completion the english government not sharing in either of the dynastic schemes of its allies and being engaged in the expedition from practical and business motives was ready to succeed from the enterprise as soon as it could see a material advantage in such a course president juarez assisted by signor zamacona who was at that time and for years afterwards one of the most distinguished of mexican statesmen both in integrity and ability as well as in tact and adroitness soon succeeded in fanning the flames of discontent between the allies into open disagreement the first diplomatic success was in arranging an interview between general prim and senor doblado the mexican secretary of state these high functionaries met on the road between cordova and orzaba and made a sort of treaty afterwards known as the convention of soledad from the name of the village where they met 
it permitted the allies to move to a more healthful situation in the tierras templadas but it adjourned the time for actual negotiations until the middle of april in this way a double advantage was gained by the mexicans they acquired from the allies a recognition of the government of president juarez and gave him time for further military preparations delaying the action of the allied expedition to a period when the fever would be most destructive to them and after the convention was agreed upon its most decided advantage on the side of the mexicans immediately declared itself prim having signed it presented it to his colleagues and while the british representative regarded it with favor as affording a precedent and basis for separate negotiation on the part of his government the french admiral positively repudiated it and the ultimate result was that to the delight of the mexicans an open feud broke out among the allies which ended in spain and england withdrawing from the alliance making separate terms with the mexican government satisfactory to their respective foreign offices at home and leaving france to carry on the invasion by herself even before this result was reached juarez foreseeing it bent all his energies to the work of dealing with the french when they should have become completely isolated he took the severest measures against those disaffected politicians who had imagined that in siding with the french they were merely carrying on a customary faction fight having captured one mexican of high rank who was complicated in the invasion he tried to execute him inside of the french camp as a traitor and felon he made a demand upon the french admiral for the expulsion from his camp of signor alamonte the leading agent of the opposition who had come to the french camp directly from paris bearing a letter from the emperor with this demand as a matter of course the french admiral refused to comply although his english and spanish colleagues advised that alamonte should be sent away the end of all these dissensions among them was that on the eighth of april eighteen sixty two general prim and sir charles wick took their leave of admiral urien de la Guerra, returned to vera cruz with the forces and sailed home the progress of the invading party was slow the unfortunate alamante did his best to carry out his part of the program by stirring up insurrections and inciting pronunciamientos in the cities nearest the french camp but the country did not take fire at his approach as he had promised the courts of paris and vienna it was evident that the force on the ground was entirely inadequate to the work to be done and general lorences came with reinforcements in the course of the spring which so far encouraged alamante and his faction that they assured the general that if he would march on puebla the city would throw open its gates at his approach deceived by these promises lorences went forward and encountered a prompt and severe defeat under the walls of puebla he was forced to retreat to orizaba whence he reported his misadventure and asked for reinforcements several indecisive engagements took place between his force and the mexican army the french had generally the advantage in battle but the vomito rapidly avenged the mexican losses by the sword even if the emperor of france had now been able to perceive the unfortunate tendency of the enterprise upon which he had entered with so little judgment and foresight it was out of his power to withdraw from it not only was the honor of france seriously engaged in this contest with a people so weak and so torn by internal dissensions that defeat of the french arms by them would have been an irreparable disgrace but he knew also that the political effect of confessing a failure in this adventure would be disastrous in the extreme he therefore sent over in october eighteen sixty two a reinforcement of thirty five thousand men under command of general fourier this force comprised besides the picked troops of the french army a force of egyptian black troops a friendly loan to the emperor from said pasha threatened by this formidable army juarez still did not lose heart but exerted himself to the utmost to prepare an adequate reception for the invaders in their next march towards the capital the city of puebla was as strongly fortified as the slender resources of the republic would permit the mexicans did not wait this time to receive an assault within their fortifications they went forward meeting the advance of foray and almost destroying a force of four thousand men under general berthier and when at last foray came with his main force before puebla it was only to repeat the disaster of lorences in the spring when winter came on tampico and Jalapa, which had been held for some time by the french were evacuated to allow foray to bring all his troops to the defence of his threatened lines and smallpox took up the work of destruction which the vomito 
at the approach of cold weather, had relinquished. With the close of the year, the only result which the French commander could report to his emperor was a sadly diminished force and a pressing necessity for reinforcements. After their refusal to join the European powers in the proposed intervention in Mexican affairs, the government of the United States saw no necessity of further action, except to define their attitude with the utmost clearness for the benefit of all parties. A circular of the Secretary of State, dated the 3rd of March, 1862, contains the following statement. The President has relied upon the assurance given his government by the Allies that they were in pursuit of no political object, but simply the redress of their grievances. He entertains no doubt of the sincerity of the Allies, and if his confidence in their good faith had been disturbed, it would be restored by the frank explanation given by them that the governments of Spain, France, and Great Britain have no intention of intervening to procure a change in the constitutional form of government now existing in Mexico, or of any political change which should be in opposition to the will of the Mexican people. In short, he has cause to believe that the Allies are unanimous in declaring that the revolution proposed to Mexico is solely prompted by certain Mexican citizens now in Europe. There is reason to think that the President was not quite so naive as to receive with absolute credulity the assertions of the Allied powers as to their innocent intentions towards the Mexican Republic, and in reading that diplomatic circular and others like it, one cannot but recognize a certain tone of courteous sarcasm in these repeated assertions of perfect faith in the representations made by the Allied monarchs. But it was not in the power of the government of the United States to take any different action at that moment, and, though giving utterance to no expressions of indignation at the aggression upon a sister republic, or of gratification at disasters which met the aggressor, the President and Mr. Seward, while continually asserting at every proper opportunity the adherence of the American government to its traditional policy of discouraging European intervention in the affairs of the New World simply bided their time. End of chapter 2Recording by Marianne. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 3. Diplomacy of 1862. The second year of Mr. Lincoln's administration was one of serious dangers and complications in the foreign relations of the United States. It was in this year that were seen the most mischievous results of the precipitate recognition of the Confederacy as a belligerent power. The original mistake of the French and British governments in putting upon equal terms a great and friendly power, and the insurgent organization of a portion of its citizens, had its condemnation repeated in the events of every month of the year 1862. The complications forced upon the diplomacy of all three nations by this state of things were met by the President and Mr. Seward not only with unyielding firmness and fortitude, but with prudence and skill a broad comprehension of legal principles, and an instinctive adherence to justice and equality. An international tribunal stamped their action with its authoritative approval, after both of them were dead, in a decision which all parties accepted, and which will probably be confirmed by the final verdict of history. We have not the space to give any adequate abstracts of the correspondence between the State Department and the American legation in London during this eventful year but the instructions of Mr. Seward and the dispatches of Charles Francis Adams will remain in the published archives of the department, a monument of the unsleeping vigilance, the unwearied industry, the patriotic devotion, and the remarkable ability of both of these statesmen, while through the whole course of these momentous discussions the guiding and controlling hand of Mr. Lincoln is continually seen as the responsible director of American policy we can only mention a few of the more important events which came under discussion during the year among the earliest subjects of difference which arose between the two countries was the refusal of the british government to allow the united states naval vessels to supply themselves with deposits of coal which the government of the united states had provided for them at nassau this injurious action of the british authorities was rendered still more flagrant by permission granted to confederate vessels to buy and take on coal in the same ports where united states vessels had not been allowed to load coal belonging to their government 
at this time also confederate cruisers were allowed to supply themselves with coal in the ports of england all these acts being complained of by mr adams were defended by lord russell on the ground that they were strictly within the provision of the queen's proclamation of neutrality mr seward protested against the approval by the british government of the proceedings of the governor of nassau as unfriendly towards a power that extends unrestricted hospitality towards the naval as well as the mercantile marine of great britain in its ports and harbors the fact that the british government justified such proceedings by a reference to the queen's proclamation of neutrality did not alleviate the grievance the explanation said mr seward obliges us to renew the declarations this government has so often made that it regards the proclamation itself as unnecessary unfriendly and injurious but by far the most important subject of discussion in its immediate and ultimate bearings was the building and fitting out in english ports of confederate cruisers to destroy the commerce of the united states in reviewing this long correspondence lasting through several years one would hesitate to say that the british government was actuated by feelings positively unfriendly to the united states it is easier to conclude that not being sure which side would win and being entirely indifferent to the contest between the federal government and the rebellion it stood simply upon the letter of the english law without regard to any consequences which might result from such action the fact is that under the eyes of the british government the work of building and making ready for sea these swift cruisers whose only object was the destruction of the peaceful commerce of a friendly nation went on to its end month after month although every stage of the progress of such hostile preparations was made known to the government by the incessant and vehement protests of the american minister in london on the eighteenth of february eighteen sixty two mr adams informed earl russell that an armed steamer was preparing to sail from liverpool to make war against the united states earl russell replied on the authority of the commissioners of customs at liverpool that the steamer was built for the purpose of peaceful commerce to be sent to palermo in sicily and work on the vessel went on a month later mr adams again wrote to the english foreign secretary repeating his conviction that the orito as the vessel was then called was a warship destined to be used by the insurgents in america to which on the eighth of april earl russell replied repeating this time upon the authority of the lords commissioners of her majesty's treasury the assurance that the orito which in the meanwhile had sailed from liverpool was an unarmed and innocent commercial vessel a week later in a personal interview mr adams again assured earl russell that the fact of the true destination of the vessel was notorious all over liverpool no commercial people were blind to it and the course taken by her majesty's officers in declaring ignorance only led to an interference most unfavorable to all idea of their neutrality in the struggle to which lord russell replied by a polite expression of regret at these circumstances but could not see how the government could change its position shortly after this innocent trading vessel arrived at nassau where she found her destined confederate commander and after some futile legal proceedings sailed for mobile bay which she entered under the british naval flag and thence sailed to begin her career of destruction on the ocean under the name of the florida and the flag of the confederacy meanwhile a more serious violation of the friendly obligations of england was in progress in the port of liverpool a vessel called at the time by her dock number of two nine zero but which afterwards achieved a wide notoriety under the name of the alabama was in process of construction in that port and preparing for sea under circumstances which left no doubt whatever of her errand one of her owners was mr laird a member of parliament who had distinguished himself by a conspicuous advocacy of the confederate cause in england and those in charge of the vessel emboldened by the action of the government in the case of the orato made no special effort to dissemble her object and purpose mr adams brought these facts to the notice of lord russell on the twenty third of june and the lord commissioners to whom the subject was referred reported with unusual promptitude only a week later that the fitting out of the vessel did not escape the notice of the revenue officers but that as yet nothing special had come to light the vessel was intended for a ship of war it was reported to be built for a foreign government but the builders were not talkative and there were not sufficient grounds to warrant her detention mr adams unable to gain the attention of the government ordered the council at liverpool to lay all the facts in his possession before the commissioners 
and requested captain craven commanding the united states ship tuscarora to endeavor to intercept the cruiser on her way out the council performed his duty with so much energy and fullness of detail that the commissioners felt bound to give the subject further attention but they still insisted july fifteenth that there was not sufficient prima facie proof to justify seizure of the vessel undaunted by these repeated rebuffs mr adams continued to ply the foreign office with documents of the most convincing character and on the twenty fourth of july sent lord russell an opinion of one of the most eminent english lawyers mr collier afterwards lord monkswell declaring positively that on the case as presented it was the duty of the liverpool authorities to detain the vessel and that they would be incurring a heavy responsibility in allowing her to go he added it appears difficult to make out a stronger case of infringement of the foreign enlistment act which if not enforced on this occasion is little better than a dead letter it is claimed on behalf of lord russell that this most important letter only reached him on the twenty sixth and that it was immediately sent to the law officers the next day was sunday and it was the afternoon of monday the twenty eighth before the law officers began their leisurely examination of the case even while sir roundell palmer and sir william atherton were examining the papers the two nine zero left her moorings and anchored in the mersey and the next morning before they had communicated to the foreign office their opinion that she ought to be stopped she had sailed away the injunction to stop her reached liverpool too late and the government sent useless orders in several directions to detain her it is said that lord russell and the duke of argyle were in favor of issuing orders to seize her in any colonial port she might enter but they were outvoted in cabinet the corsair evaded the tuscarora by passing out through the north channel and was joined at the western islands by a bark which had taken on at london a cargo of arms while she was completing her armament another english vessel arrived with captain raphael semmes formerly of the sumter and his staff on board a further supply of arms and the rest of her crew captain semmes took control and drawing up the crew read his commission as a post captain in the confederate navy and opened his sealed orders in which he was directed to hoist the confederate ensign and pennant and to sink burn or destroy everything which flew the ensign of the so-called united states of america the flag was raised a gun was fired and semmes declared his vessel duly commissioned in the confederate service the vessel was english the armament was english and almost all the crew were english the alabama sailed at once on her mission of robbery and destruction her method of procedure was unique in the annals of war there was not a port in existence into which she could carry a prize she therefore destroyed every merchant vessel sailing under the american flag which she could fall in with robbing them of whatever portable articles of value she could find on board bonding those who would sign a bond crowding her own decks with sailors and passengers until the throng was so great that there was no more room for them and then putting them aboard some passing vessel captain semmes amused himself by occasionally putting the captain of some petty trader or whaler in irons informing them that it was in retaliation for the treatment of confederates by washington authorities great efforts were made by the american government to track and find this rover of the deep but the pursuit of a single vessel on the high seas is almost like the pursuit of a single bird in the immensity of the heavens while the sabine was searching the coast of the azores the alabama was supplying herself with coal from a british bark at martinique while the wyoming was watching off manila the alabama was enjoying british hospitalities at singapore and in brief she never came in contact with any armed vessel of the united states except on two occasions on the night of the eleventh of january eighteen sixty three she approached near enough to the hatteras a mere delaware river excursion boat under the false hail of her majesty's ship petrel to fire a broadside into the american vessel which sent her to the bottom and in june eighteen sixty four she met the kearsarge in the english channel and a just retribution at the mouth of her guns british commerce was itself not entirely exempt from damage from this piratical cruiser many of the vessels destroyed bore cargoes belonging to english merchants and though in the long run the destruction of american commerce inured to the benefit of english shipowners the inconveniences and damage inflicted upon british interests at the beginning of this confederate piracy were not inconsiderable and an attempt was made by british shippers to induce their government and their legation at washington to interfere for their protection 
by application to the confederate government to grant immunity to british goods on american vessels or failing that to furnish british shippers with letters protesting against the destruction of british merchandise requests which of course were refused on the last day of september eighteen sixty two mr adams addressing the british government in regard to the injuries inflicted by the alabama on american commerce informed them that he had strong reasons to believe that other enterprises of the same kind were in progress in the ports of great britain of such notoriety as to be openly announced in the newspapers of liverpool and london to which lord russell made the dry reply i have to say to you that much as her majesty's government desire to prevent such occurrences they are unable to go beyond the law municipal and international on the sixteenth of october mr adams reported to the state department it is very manifest that no disposition exists here to apply the powers of the government to the investigation of the acts complained of flagrant as they are or to the prosecution of the offenders the main object must now be to make a record which may be of use at some future day the record was made and it proved to be of use there was a moment indeed at the close of the year eighteen sixty two when the british government had apparently some idea of so amending their foreign enlistment act as to give greater power to the executive to prevent the construction of ships in british ports to be used against friendly powers this suggestion was made to mr adams who communicated it to his government and having obtained their instructions informed lord russell that his suggestions of amendment which would make the enlistment act more effective had been favorably considered that although the law of the united states was regarded as sufficient the government were not unwilling to consider propositions to improve it but lord russell then replied march eighteen sixty three that since his note was written the subject had been considered in cabinet and the lord chancellor had expressed the opinion that the british law was sufficiently effective and that under these circumstances he did not see that he could have any change to propose on the nineteenth of january eighteen sixty three the state department transmitted to mr adams a large amount of evidence from confederate sources showing a systemic violation of the neutrality laws in england he laid this testimony before earl russell on the ninth of february saying in his grave and measured style these papers go to show a deliberate attempt to establish within the limits of this kingdom a system of action in direct hostility to the government of the united states this plan embraces not only the building and fitting out of several ships of war under the direction of agents especially commissioned for the purpose but the preparation of a series of measures under the same auspices for the obtaining from her majesty's subjects the pecuniary means essential to the execution of their hostile projects it was a month before lord russell replied to this communication he then treated it as of little importance saying that even if the allegations were true there was no proof in the papers that the agents referred to had as yet brought themselves within the reach of the criminal law of england in view of the negotiations for the amendment of the criminal law which had just been attempted and given up because the british government could find nothing to amend mr adams justly thought this a singular attitude to assume and sought an interview with lord russell on the twenty sixth of march lord russell himself reported the essential results of that interview in a dispatch to lord lyons with respect to the law itself mr adams said either it was sufficient for the purposes of neutrality and then let the british government enforce it or it was insufficient and then let the british government apply to parliament to amend it i said that the cabinet were of the opinion that the law was sufficient but that legal evidence could not always be procured that the british government had done everything in its power to execute the law but i admitted that the cases of the alabama and oreto were a scandal and in some degree a reproach to our laws thus in the view of mr lincoln and mr seward a great and friendly nation was put upon the level of an ordinary litigant compelled to use only such evidence as would be valid to convict a criminal in court and was told that although the english law permitted scandalous violations of neutrality no proposition to amend the law would be entertained all through the year the correspondence continued mr adams representing in strong though temperate and courteous language the injuries done to the interests of both countries not only by the construction in british ports of vessels of war for the use of the insurgents but also by the constant and apparently organized efforts of british subjects to break the blockade the risk in this unlawful traffic were very great but the profits were commensurate with the dangers and every successful voyage stimulated the cupidity and the enterprise of adventurous traders 
so that the evil continually increased to all the representations of the american government the british ministry replied that it was impossible to listen to any suggestion in the direction of imposing arbitrary restrictions on the trading of her majesty's subjects the ingenuity of persons engaged in commerce will always in some degree defeat attempts to starve or debar from commercial intercourse an extensive coast inhabited by a large and industrious population the american minister immediately responded naturally enough that if the laws of great britain were not sufficiently efficacious to prevent proceedings so injurious not only to her own interests but to those of a friendly nation the government should take steps to have those laws amended these propositions were not entertained by the british government they preferred to stand upon their municipal law as at present constituted early in the year the government of the united states by its own unprovoked and unsolicited movement proposed to that of great britain the removal of a source of conflict and irritation between the two countries that more than once had brought them to the verge of war they proposed to provide by treaty between the two countries for the suppression of the african slave trade and for the reciprocal right of visitation by the ships of their respective navies of such merchant vessels of the two nations as might upon reasonable grounds be suspected of being engaged in the african slave trade or of being fitted out for that object a treaty for this purpose was signed at washington on the seventh of april ratified by the senate unanimously and afterwards distinctly approved with no less unanimity by both houses of congress mr seward said of it it was freely offered by this government to great britain not bought nor solicited by that government it is in harmony with the sentiments of the american people not a voice has been raised against it in the country this treaty demanded by the moral sense of the american people was regarded at the time with disfavor by those powers which still cherished the institution of slavery in their colonies it was the special subject of criticism by the government of spain in a conversation with mr perry calderon colantes admitted that spain had herself conceded to great britain the same right of visitation at a period of her history which could not be recalled with pleasure the exercise of this right was vexatious and besides the english were always talking in parliament and out of their having purchased the right of spain for forty thousand pounds sterling always putting their money forward and he would be exceedingly glad of an opportunity to give them their forty thousand pounds and have their treaty back again in france the difficulties which presented themselves to the american minister and the questions which he was compelled to discuss were of a somewhat different character from those which were forced upon the attention of mr adams in england in the early part of the year william l dayton placed on record a remarkable admission which was made to him in conversation by the emperor himself when mr dayton was showing the injurious results of the proclamation of neutrality of france and england the emperor declared frankly that when the insurrection broke out and this concession of belligerent rights was made he did not suppose the north would succeed that it was the general belief of statesmen in europe that the two sections would never come together again and this belief he intimated was the principal reason why the concession of belligerent rights was then granted the government of france even more than that of england set forth the inconveniences to which commerce was subjected by the stoppage of the american supply of cotton and urged the government of the united states to take some measures to renew that supply during the first year of the war the american government hoped that the capture of a few southern seaports would greatly modify that inconvenience and were seriously disappointed when it was found out that even the capture of so important a place as new orleans did not result in any considerable supply of cotton as the year wore on the french projects of intervention in mexico took more and more definite shape and the relations of the two countries while they continued outwardly as cordial and as friendly as ever became subjected to a certain strain by virtue of the conviction which was forced upon each that the intentions cherished by the other were not altogether acceptable the opinion in america slowly gained ground that if the french were suffered to establish themselves in mexico the most serious complications might arise upon our southwestern border and the government in france was more or less preoccupied with the question as to what policy would be adopted in regard to the french in mexico by the president of the united states in case of a complete victory of the national forces over the insurgents for this reason the emperor became excessively anxious for some settlement of the american conflict other than the complete and final victory of the union cause and for that purpose the governments of england and russia were consulted by that of france 
and invited to enter into a joint proposition to the united states for mediation between the national government and the insurgents in announcing this intention to mr dayton mr drawn de la hoy the french minister of foreign affairs covered the disagreeable fact with the friendliest and most amiable terms declining even to use so forcible a term as mediation and saying if there were any word which could express less than that such a word should be used in its place mr dayton asked him what would be the result if such an offer should be made and refused he answered at once nothing we will be friends as we have been mr dayton before terminating the interview expressed himself and with such sincerity and frankness that no doubt should have been left in the mind of the french minister to the effect that any such overture made jointly or singly to the united states would be useless and in fact every utterance public or confidential of the government of the united states through every channel of expression from the beginning of the war to that time ought to have shown to all the european powers the utter futility of such measures it was the very foundation of all the president's instructions to ministers abroad that such suggestions from foreign powers were utterly beyond their competence to receive or discuss that the rebellion was exclusively a municipal matter the importance of which he had no thought of disguising but with which no foreign power had the slightest right to interfere but undeterred by any such considerations the government of france persisted in its attempt to bring about a joint overture of mediation between the united states and the force in arms against them in a dispatch addressed by the imperial government to its ministers in england and russia it was proposed that the three cabinets should exert their influence at washington as well as with the confederates to obtain an armistice for six months during which time every act of war direct or indirect should provisionally cease on the sea as well as on land and it might be if necessary ulteriorly prolonged the overture said Duran de la hue would not imply on our part any judgment of the original or issue of the struggle nor any pressure upon the negotiations which might it is to be hoped ensue in favour of an armistice our task would consist solely in smoothing down obstacles and not interfering except in a measure determined upon by the two parties we are not in fact to believe ourselves called upon to decide but to prepare the solution of difficulties which hitherto have opposed reconciliation between the belligerent parties he thought the three powers would combine conditions best suited to inspire confidence the government of the emperor by the constant tradition of french policy towards the united states england by the community of race russia by the marks of friendship she had never ceased to show to the washington cabinet even should the attempt fail the emperor thought it might be of use it would fulfil a duty of humanity and perhaps encourage public opinion to views of conciliation the english government replied to this overture on the thirteenth of november while recognizing the benevolent views and humane intentions of the emperor the british government concluded that there was no ground at that moment to hope that the federal government would accept the proposed suggestion and a refusal from washington at that time would prevent any speedy renewal of the offer the government of the queen therefore concluded that it would be better to wait and watch the progress of events in america to the end that if there should appear to be hereafter a change of public opinion such steps might be taken then with a better hope of success the reply of the russian government was equally decided in its refusal prince gortschakoff said that it was especially necessary to avoid the appearance of any pressure whatsoever of a nature to wound public opinion in the united states and to excite susceptibilities very easily roused at the bare idea of foreign intervention even in the case of the french and english governments regarding such a step as opportune the russian government declined to join in it but promised that their minister at washington should unofficially give his moral support to any conciliatory measures that might be taken even at this time when the russian government was giving this conspicuous proof of its friendly feeling towards the united states there was little confidence felt in st petersburg of the ultimate success of the national cause prince gortchakoff said to bayard taylor on the twenty ninth of october your situation is getting worse and worse the chances of preserving the union are growing more and more desperate can you find no basis of arrangement before your strength is so exhausted that you must lose for many years to come your position in the world many years elapsed before it became generally known how near the british government had come to accepting or even anticipating the overtures of france for mediation on the seventeenth of october eighteen sixty one 
lord john russell had proposed a somewhat peremptory summons to the north and south to make up their quarrel but lord palmerston had not thought it advisable in september eighteen sixty two lord palmerston himself revised the proposition in a note to lord russell who was in attendance on the queen at gotha lord russell at once gave his adhesion to the scheme i agree with you he said that the time is come for offering mediation to the united states government with a view to the recognition of the independence of the confederates i agree further that in case of failure we ought ourselves to recognize the southern states as an independent state lord palmerston answered in the same vein but when the matter was broached to lord granville who was by this time in attendance on the queen on the continent he protested against the scheme with such energy as somewhat to shake lord palmerston's determination besides this the confederates had not pushed their successes against mcclellan as the english expected and when on the twenty third of october the cabinet met to consider the subject the strong objections of sir george grey and the duke of newcastle were sufficient to prevent action and the next month the cabinet rejected the very proposal coming from france which its principal members had intended to lay before the emperor End of chapter three